Anyway, we're going to talk about <clears throat> the anatomy of atrial septal defects. And we'll start off with uh, Peyton Freeman O'Valley. This is a, an open right atrium here. Uh, and <clears throat> what we can see inside here is the area of the fossa ovalis here. You can see the probe here inside the fossa. You can see septum primum, septum secundum, and there's a little opening here between the top of septum primum and septum secundum on the other side. There's also a little tear there in septum primum. Here you can see the mm -hmm. appendage, the tricuspid valve. Now if we look from the left atrial aspect, here you can see septum primum overlapping septum secundum. So this is a, a foramen ovale as opposed to an atrial septal defect. Whereas here we see an atrial septal defect. This is again the open right atrium. And here's, <clears throat> you can see this is the cut edge of inferior vena cava down here at the bottom. Superior vena cava entering here. This is the ostium of coronary sinus. And uh, we'll also see the tricuspid annulus over here to get you oriented. This is the area of the fossa ovalis here. And these are just pectinate muscles as they come out of the appendage down into the body of the atrium. Here in the fossa, with the septum secundum up here and the upper edge of septum primum here, here's septum secundum, the defect is between septum primum and septum secundum, and here's a hole, another type of defect within the substance of septum primum. So one type, eh, this is really not working out for some reason. One type of secundum atrial septal defect is here between the upper border of septum primum and septum secundum, and the other type is a defect or a deficiency within the substance of septum primum, as you can see right here. Just go ahead and look at this from the left atrial side. Let's see if we can, I don't know if I can move this forward or not. Here's the fossa again with the septum secundum or superior limbic band, septum primum. Uh, here, a hole in septum primum the other more common type of secundum atrial septal defect between the upper border of septum primum and septum secundum above. And then if we look at this from the left atrial side, we'll see here are the edges of septum primum as they insert up on septum secundum. Here's the mitral valve over here. The appendage uh, is up here for orientation pulmonary veins would be entering the back here, and this is uh, the secundum atrial septal defect, septum secundum, uh, the upper edge of septum primum, uh, and the hole here within septum primum. Sometimes the entire uh, septum primum can be absent, as it is in this case. Uh, here all we see is septum secundum in the right atrium. Uh, there's no septum primum at all. There's a huge defect in this case. Here we're looking down toward the tricuspid valve, and this you can see is the uh, septum secundum up here. And we don't see any of the floor or the, the lower part of the atrial septum. There's no uh, septum primum at all here uh, in this particular example. Another type of defect, those are the, the most common types of defects, the ones that occur within uh, the fossa ovalis, septum secundum type defects. Um, this is, in fact, a. Uh, why it didn't that? I don't know. Here we go. This is a sinus venosus defect. Here's, in this case, the tricuspid valve and right ventricle. Here's the fossa uh, here where we saw the defects before. It's completely intact. And there's the coronary sinus here with the tricuspid annulus here. Further around to the right and more posteriorly, we see a large defect here, and it's near the entrance of the right pulmonary veins. Those are the right upper pulmonary veins from the right lung uh, as they come in, uh, and they, the superior vena cava coming in from above. So this is a sinus venosus defect, and you can see that the right pulmonary veins enter here. This is really the path of the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. If you put a patch as the probe is indicating there, and sutured it like that around the defect and around the pulmonary veins, then the pulmonary venous blood would drain through the hole into the left atrium. 
and SVC blood would drain in front of the patch into the right atrium, and you could, could fix it. From the left side, uh, again, we see the defect here. This is the fossil valis area, so this is further around to the right from that. This is the appendage up there, the mitral valve over here for orientation. And here are left pulmonary veins, here and here, and here's the defect right there. So this is a type of sinus venosus defect associated with the superior vena cava. And there you see the left pulmonary veins here and here entering the left atrium. The other type of sinus venosus defect involves an overriding superior vena cava like this, where the superior vena cava can in fact drain to both atria. And this is an example of that. Here you can see the right atrium with the appendage area up here. Here's the area of the fossa ovalis, which is intact here, coronary sinus osteum. And here's the superior vena cava right here, partly opening into the right atrium. And we can put the probe through the osteum here up into the superior vena cava. Now if we go to the left atrium, you see the left atrial appendage here. Here's the fossa area there. And here's the defect right here in the same position that we saw the sinus venosus defect before. And you can enter the cava or you can enter from this directly into right upper pulmonary vein there. Now if we look at this in a little different orientation from above, from the roof of the atrium from the outside, we'll see the two appendages on either side. Here's the left atrial appendage here. Here's the right atrial appendage here, left and right. And here's the open superior vena cava. And we can see the crest of the septum down below in the cava. You can get to either the left atrium here or to the right atrium on the other side. there. And the path that's usually taken through here by the pulmonary veins into the left atrium is what allows the superior vena cava to in fact drain to both atria as you see up here in this cartoon. The veins come in here should have continued through this orifice into the left atrium, but because the wall between the veins and the superior vena cava is missing, uh, the veins drain to the superior vena cava and the cava drains into both atria. So this is the, that type of sinus venosus defect. And the last type of interatrial communication that I want to show you is a coronary sinus defect. This is a hole between coronary sinus and left atrium. Here we're looking into the right atrium. This is the patch that you see here on the atrial septum. This patient's already been operated, unfortunately didn't survive. Here's a large coronary sinus osseum and the tricuspid valve there. The appendage and pectinate muscles are all seen over here. Now, when we turn to the left atrium, we see the osteum of the coronary sinus defect here. This is the path of coronary sinus going back. There you can see the patch on the atrial septum. Here's the appendage and the mitral valve would be that direction. And here you see the osteum of the coronary sinus defect. So the coronary sinus should have uh, been solid here, but there's an opening between the coronary sinus and the left atrium. And in fact, there's also a persistent left superior vena cava right up here that would come down and drain to the coronary sinus. But in fact, there's unroofing or lack of the wall between the part of the coronary sinus that would usually connect the left cava with the rest of the coronary sinus. So we get a cava draining to the atrium most of the time. It doesn't happen all the time, but most patients with a coronary sinus defect have a persistent left cava. And you can have shunting from left to right through the coronary sinus osteum. So those are the types of interatrial communications that one can see. Thanks very much, Steve. That was great. Um, I'm just going to show you uh, the uh, cross-sectional anatomy of this. Mm -hmm. 
Let me have my laptop here. Oh, I'll give you a little space. So, um, just as Dr. Sanders had said, if you look at the intraatrial communications, uh, osteum secundum is the commonest lesion. Osteum primum, which we'll discuss with AV canals, largely speaking. Sinus venosus of two types. The sinus venosus is incorporated into the superior vena, into the right atrium, and uh, there are parts of it uh, from below that may also be associated with defects, coronary sinus septal defects, and Lastly, I think the defect that, they, that uh, Steve showed, uh, the lower one in the septum uh, secundum, the defect of osteum primum, is called by some the vestibular defect or from the vestibular spine of Rokitansky. Now, as an echocardiographer, I always like to make sure that I look at general before I do specific. So here's an example of a patient with an enlarged right ventricle and right ventricular volume overload. You can see that in this parasternal long axis, that the right atrium, uh, the right ventricle is enlarged. Uh, the septum motion is flat, as you can judge here from the uh, M-mode echocardiogram, which shows uh, what we call paradoxical septal motion. And when you look in the full chamber view, you can see that the right side of the heart is larger than the left. That usually indicates that there is a shunt at atrial level or from pulmonary veins to systemic veins. Now, this used to be the most boring subject in all of cardiology, atrial septal defects. You know, you found an atrial septal defect, you sent them to surgery. Okay, then came along these devices which changed the whole pattern because now many of these defects can be fixed with a transcatheter approach. Largely they can do that in the ostium secundum region and so it's now important to look at what you're looking at in terms of the atrial septum and of course, I'm sure Girish will show you some beautiful pictures of how we look at the atrial septum, how it moves in real time. It's not always the same size. And we can divide the atrial septum into the superior, anterior superior, or um, uh, the, the anterior inferior, or aortic mound position. This is where the ascending aorta usually lies. The, post, the inferior, posterior inferior, and posterior superior part of the atrial septum. So just let's look at some interatrial communications. Here you see an enlarged left atrium, and of course there's the pit, pit picture of the shunt. Right and left atrium, shunt. Here's a patient who, just like uh, Dr. Sanders's patient, has a high phosphovalus defect and another lesion at the bottom. The question is, is this a separate lesion was it really coming through the coronary sinus? And I think it's probably a shunt coming uh, through uh, into the right atrium from a normal coronary sinus and not a separate defect. This is looking at a subcostal coronal plane and here is the, at 90 degrees, the subcostal sagittal with anterior, posterior, superior and inferior. And you can see the superior vena caval blood coming into the right atrium with a little uh, fossa valus defect here, which we see very frequently in the neonatal period and which tends to disappear. And this is what's uh, really changed the whole pattern, these uh, septal occluders, which can be placed by catheter and uh, are placed in all of our institutions. Uh, certainly you have to know about this in terms of what the size of the discs are and how big the central portion is so that you can put it in what these defects really are, these, uh, these uh, devices really are, they giant stents with balloons at either side that collapse on each other and form a nice seal around the atrial septum, whereas the defect is stented by this middle section of the, um, of the device. And we size them, we size them with balloons, and we blow up the balloon until the balloon occludes the atrial septal defect. This is a joint uh, um, venture between uh, the interventional cardiologists and the echocardiographers. Uh, uh, we use strongly now the, um, the, um, the echocardiography to make sure that there's a little leak so that we don't over this 
and put in too big a device in the atrial septum. Just a pathological picture to show you what happens to this device. There's a little Teflon uh, on the inside of each of these little um, structures and you can see after six months how beautifully these already are endothelialized and after years exclude from the circulation. Here is a transesophageal device placement. You can see here's the device on the atrial septum. Okay, and then it's placed across the atrial septum and released and you can see the color comes after that and we look around in all different directions to make sure that the device is normally placed. And then afterwards we inject a saline uh, contrast uh, here, make sure there's no right to left shunt, make sure all of the limbs are adequately placed and that there's no defect. And here you can see that although this device seems to be beautifully placed, there's a little leak that is still present. Many of these leaks seal themselves after time, but it's also important to notice that they're there and to make sure that the device is adequately placed. This one seems to be out of the plane of the atrial septum. That shouldn't happen if we're under uh, careful uh, uh, monitoring. And here's a, a device which is placed, and you can see at the end part of this that uh, there's still a little leak at the end. And of course, uh, sometimes this happens. There's the little leak there. And uh, then we have to decide, well, is this one of these leaks that's going to seal by itself? And frequently they do. And so we won't go in and do anything again about them. And there you can see them in, in two planes. There's the device placed in the leak, as, as, as I've shown you. Now, this is, uh, we also use a catheter called the intracardiac catheter or ICE device. And that's uh, placed by the interventionists frequently without having an echocardiography in the room. They seem to like that a lot. Uh, we don't. There's the balloon inflated. Okay, and you can see at the time that the, the balloon inflated, we measure the size, 1.58, 1.6 uh, centimeters. And then an appropriate device is sized for that particular size. And there's the device placed across the atrial septum. In this particular device, the left atrium is on this side and the right atrium is on that side. And you can see how beautifully this is sealed. Frequently you see how the septum seems to be distorted before the, the device is released. And here's an echo closure. You see the device looks like it's not appropriately placed there. It's put back in again and uh, uh, we tell the, uh, the uh, interventionist. Now we see it on both sides and we do what is called the Minnesota wiggle, which uh, looks to see that the atrial septum is in between the device as you move it backwards and forwards, there's the pull and the push is not shown but we do that in both dimensions and there's another little leak uh, in, in that atrial septum there with a device placed which requires an additional device. I'm going to move on with that here. So we've seen this many times. Now osteum primum defects really part of atrial septal defects. Of course here is an osteum secundum defect with an osteum primum defect. Um, it's not an uncommon uh, uh, finding to have an osteum secundum defect in addition to an osteum primum uh, as part of uh, the AV canal defects and easily taken care of by the surgeon. And you can see the difference between the osteum primum defect below and the osteum secundum defect higher up in the atrial septum and I've used a transesophageal as well as surface echo to show that these are all the same regardless of which technique you use. Now Steve had shown a sinus venosis defect very beautifully. Here is the um, sinus venosis defect at the upper limb uh, between the palmary vein and the superior vena cava. Here's the palmary vein, the superior vena cava is cannulated and out of the field and you can see where the red blood is uh, situated in the left atrium. The fossa valus is down here. This is coronary sinus, how the surgeons see these defect. And basically he's going to put a patch in which is going to take care of uh, bringing the, inf uh, the, the right upper pulmonary veins into the left atrium uh, at the same time bearing in mind and minding that he doesn't obstruct the flow from the superior vena cava into the atrium. 
And here is a trans, uh, uh, is, um, um, a, a normal um, surface echo showing the position of the uh, fossa uh, of this uh, sinus venosus ASD. Here you see the upper palmary vein. Here you see the superior vena cava, and you see the shunt going in this direction. Here's a magnified view. It's a sort of an oblique view by a transesophageal echo. And you can see that there's, as Dr. Sanders pointed out so clearly, that the superior vena cava frequently appears to override the atrial septum in much the same way as the aorta overrides the ventricular septum in tetralogy of Fallot. And I think you can see that from the three-dimensional uh, pictures here as well. Now, the Cori Sinus ASD, uh, Steve showed us a beautiful example. Here's uh, what you see echocardiographically. You get to the back of the heart, to the crooks, and you see the coronary sinus draining into the right atrium. Of course, that could be an enlarged coronary sinus, so it requires us to make some special um, uh, um, looks at that to see the coronary sinus septal defect. Uh, let me just uh, move this one on. This is an inferior sinus venosus ASD, and you can see here the IVC almost straddles the atrial septum as well, and this is left atrium and this is right atrium. Here's the eustachian valve, a uh, very uncommon defect, uh, but certainly one that, um, that uh, uh, it does exist. Now back to coronary sinus septal defects. Here, in a coronary sinus septal defect, you might see the coronary sinus, and if I were to be able to uh, get rid of the labels here, you can see where the coronary sinus is draining into the left atrium in much the same way as uh, Dr. Sanders showed us uh, looking at this view from the left atrium. Okay, and here we see uh, what looks like the entrance of the coronary sinus. Here is the coronary sinus draining into the left atrium. Here you see all the way from the pulmonary veins into the right atrium. Uh, something almost looks like a total veins to the coronary sinus, which we'll see later, but uh, clearly this is a, a defect of the coronary sinus septum. And one, as uh, Dr. Sanders showed, a large percentage of these patients have a persistent left superior vena cava, and you can use that very eloquently by injecting uh, saline contrast into the left arm, and when you do that, you'll see first that it fills the coronary sinus, then it fills the right atrium, but not the back part of the left atrium, which is receiving blood that hasn't been washed out by the contrast, and then obviously it goes into both ventricles. You can see this in the four-chamber view, and in the long-axis view at the beginning of the scan. If you go to the beginning of the scan, you see the first blush of the contrast is coming into the left into the coronary sinus, then fills the left atrium, and then within almost the same beat, you can see the contrast material in the right ventricular outflow tract. So that's very useful, uh, and uh, although there are lesions where there isn't a persistence of the left superior vena cava, it's quite unusual, and that's a really excellent test because it provides you all the information that you need. So that's all I have to show about uh, atrial septal defects. We'll now move on to the three-dimensional imaging thereof. Just quick. It's up there. I think it's yours upside, upside down. It's usually the other way. Okay, so um, got it. Okay, 
So what I'm going to do um, with this talk is really just uh, uh, discuss the role of um, of, uh, of 3D echo um, for um, uh, for device closures, because I think uh, as uh, as exactly as uh, uh, Dr. Silverman said, that's really where the you know the whole concept of rims and and location and um, uh, number of devices and real time guidance becomes important. So. Um, in terms of um, um, screening, before you actually go in, um, clearly transthoracic echo is the, is, is the best way to screen somebody to figure out whether they're going to be a candidate for a device or not. Um, and for transthoracic echo, the role of 3D imaging is limited. It's limited because of, uh, of transducers. So there's one transducer that's a PEDS transducer, there's another one that's an adult transducer, and then most of our patients end up being in the middle, and it becomes a little bit of a, a, little bit of a challenge uh, for that. So I'm not really going to spend a whole lot of time discussing this. This is mu not much of an issue when it comes to VSDs and other things where the structures of interest are thick, or AV valves, for example. So I'll, sh I'll spend a lot of time later today and tomorrow and, and all of that, talking about common AV valves and uh, canals, mitral valves, tricuspid valves, uh, conotruncal malformations. But when it comes to the atrial septum, it's a thin structure. And so the potential for dropout is very significant with uh, 3D imaging. So, so I think it's important to, to recognize that. Now, when we do guidance of uh, 3D uh, of uh, device closure, uh, our goal is to um, obtain images, to process that information quickly, uh, use multiple planes, uh, be aware of uh, what else is happening. And there are different models for this. Uh, in many parts of the developing world, uh, the person doing the echo is also the person doing the intervention. Uh, I don't know how they do that. It's great that they can. Um, in, in the West, we tend to have one person who does the the TE and the other person doing the, uh, doing the actual uh, intervention. Um, very important for the echocardiographer to communicate. Uh, so to keep asking, keep telling, keep talking with the interventionist about what they're thinking uh, and so on. Um, now, uh, we like to use multiple planes and um, we really want to try to use multiple planes very quickly. If the device is going to slip, it usually slips around the aorta. So um, we use around a 30 degree view, and whether you use 2D or live 3D doesn't matter. It's still a 30 degree view. Uh, you use that to look at the stability of the discs and doing the wiggle that, uh, that Norman talked about. We use a zero degree view to look for impingement on the AV valves and the pulmonary veins. Once again, whether it's live 3D or 2D echo doesn't matter. The, the, uh, all that you get with, the, you know, with, the, with 2D, when you go from 2D to live 3D, it's just thickening. You're just thickening the wedge. So that's that's really all that you're that you're doing. Um, and then we use a 90 degree view to look at the veins, the inflows. So the SVC rim, we've seen a couple of patients where the right atrial disc got caught on the crista instead of uh, sort of coming over. And then the posterior inferior rim. To show the posterior inferior rim, you have to retroflex the the TE probe um, sometimes. So here are some examples of what Norman wanted me to show. Um, so this shows you a live 3D image of, the, uh, of an ASD, a secundum ASD. We've cropped away the rest of the heart just to show you the, the, the defect. And you'll notice several things here in this picture. One is it's dynamic. It moves a lot. And so you can imagine that when we make these very um, specific dimension measurements for the interventionalist or, 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 uh, or somebody saying this defect is 6.7 by 9.7 millimeters, um, I don't know how much meaning they have, those measurements, because you just look at this defect. So maybe it might make more sense to <coughs> trace out the entire defect. I don't know. Look at those green dots. You see the green dots? So those are actually markers that tell you that the, each of these markers, horizontally or vertically, is about two millimeters apart. So it gives you a rough idea for not just the size of the defect, but also for uh, guiding, uh, uh, you know, for replacing fluoroscopy. And I'll kind of uh, get to that in a minute. When you zoom up on structures this much, you lose sight of a lot of the rest of the stuff. So for example, I'm not going to tell you that you can make rim measurements by 3D echo. You can't. You can't make them. You have to make them by 2D. Um, you, can, you can assess proximity and that kind of thing. This is a, um, 
uh, sort of a classic uh, ASD, secundum ASD in the fossa ovalis, and this shows you how one rim is stable and the other rim is floppy. Um, this is the planimetry that I was talking about earlier, that when you have defects that are of irregular sizes and shapes, um, you know, uh, you can actually get this kind of a measurement, and maybe you can extrapolate this back to figure out what, what device size is really needed. Um, this is very analogous to uh, one of the hearts that, uh, that Steve Sanders showed you uh, of a fenestrated uh, secundum ASD, where you have multiple holes and strands going across. And what you're trying to do here is you're trying to figure out, um, you know, when the catheter, when the interventionalist tries to put, put the catheter through, what it's going through. Uh, for example, when you see this and you see uh, holes up above and, you know, then th Basically, the picture is talking to you. It's telling you where, what the what the what the uh, sheath is going through here. Um, very very much of an advantage. Now this is a, a very different kind of view. All of these are. You have to kind of make these views up, and much of what you do with making these views up is really starting out with getting used to the pathology, talking to surgeons, um, and then deciding with the interventionalist what makes sense to them while you uh, while you perform the procedure, perform the echo. So in this heart, what we've done is we've cut away the front and the top of the heart. So this is the atrial septum. This is above and that's below. Um, this is the uh, mitral orifice over here. Uh, this is the aortic valve over here. So uh, right. So this here, what you're seeing is that this. Um, uh, uh, catheter is pointing anteriorly. And when you see it pointing anteriorly, there's no point that for them to even go, go to fluoroscopy. Uh, they need to make it move back, point towards the pulmonary veins, because otherwise they're going to be pointing to the appendage. They don't want to open their device out in an appendage. So that's uh, um, one, of the, one of the things. The next thing here, look at this. So here's a five millimeter distance difference. So for example, that's a plane of the atrial septum. There's where the device is. So once you know that, what our interventionists do now is just sort of based to minimize the radiation exposure from fluoroscopy. So they know that they can pull back this thing at least a centimeter before they get to the atrial septum. So there's no point really having a fluoro on to show that. You can just do it with echo. So that's one of the uh, things that we do. Notice now for, for this, we are, we are at 30 degrees, and this is a live 3D and our frame rate is 35. So those are the important things that I like to keep keep in mind when I'm looking at a, an echo image to decide what the quality of the image is. If this frame rate were low, I would have I would have a problem with it, um, you know, and um, uh, and so on. Uh, now here we have the same same sort of everything else remains about the same, but we've gone to about 85 degrees now, and now the right atrial disc is out, and now you see the the sort of the septum. Um, uh, between these two things, and and once again the septum between the two, different projection now. We're looking from behind forwards. Uh, the left atrial disc is here. The right atrial disc is here. The right atrial uh, disc uh, attachment di uh, mechanism is still intact. It hasn't been detached yet. We have we've not told them that it's, that it's quite ready. But look at the texture of the left atrial disc. You get a sense for for how these things really uh, look, uh, or something like that. Yeah. They look much more like uh, like the real thing, uh, just as the atrial septum did, and so on. This uh, this was a very very interesting patient. Um, uh, for this heart, what we've done is we've uh, we, we, by 2D echo we could tell that the defect was low. It was close to the coronary sinus, and what we've done here is we've cut away the front of the right atrium. So this is the tricuspid valve over here. That's the fossa ovalis over there. This is the Thibesian valve over here. And that's the mouth of the coronary sinus over there. And this thing over here is the defect, this, this gap over here. So it looks like a slit. It's anterior to posterior slit, very unusual. And, um, you know, and then um, we judged that that was uh, going to be a reasonable distance from the coronary sinus for closure. So this is uh, just before the thing was released. Coronary sinus is down here. Uh, it worked out quite well, um, and so on. Multiple defects, again, uh, an important challenge for, um, for 2D uh, transesophageal echo. So this is a patient who has one, two, three kind of uh, defects. She was in atrial fibrillation with a very irregular um, uh, heart rate. 
uh, and so getting a volumetric uh, analysis with 3D would have been impossible. So this is kind of live imaging. This is a different patient. Here we've put in one device. This patient was, a, this is an adult who had had um, a, a stroke. So she, was, she had a positive uh, contrast study. So we knew she had a PFO. She's a big lady, it's technically difficult, transthoracic echo. My TE, it looked like she had one hole. Um, we went after that one hole by 2D TE. Went after that one hole, closed it with this uh, cribriform device. Everything looked great, except that septum bulging right to left. I mean, left to right into the. So you can see this is a this is a big problem now. So this is holding on to something, but you got a big hole and then multiple fenestrations inside that hole. So this was clearly something that we had not anticipated at all, and we had not caught by uh, 2DT. So so we went after this. Here's the one device. Here's the wire crossing above that device. So the goal would be to put one more over here and then probably put one more over here. That's the, the general goal. So now there's one device there, there's one more device there, and you still have a gap. So two devices, still a gap. Here comes a third device. So third one's going to go in. And it's important to th remember that people like this, we don't just do this because of bravado. It's also because these are not surgical candidates. Surgeons don't want to touch these patients. These are morbidly obese people with patients with, uh, with multiple sort of uh, other problems. So you've got to do something. Um, and uh, there we go. So there's the third device in now. So one, two, three, three devices are in and uh, you know, it, it, it worked out uh, superbly for her. So there are limitations with 3D. Uh, signal dropout we talked about when the, you know, physics is physics. Basically when the, when the atrial septum is perpendicular to, is parallel to your transducer, you're going to have dropout. That's just the way it goes. There's a learning curve with it. Uh, the, the views that I'm showing you, the views that I'm going to keep showing you over the next three days are non-standard views. There are no standards for this. So you kind of have to make it up as you go along. And I found that pathology and uh, surgery are useful, useful tools. Probe size is an issue. Currently, patient under general anesthesia weighing over 20 kilos <coughs> is what you need. And the probe is expensive. Um, there is potential to decrease fluoroscopy. So in summary, I think it's an important kind of an advance. And uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. Questions? Questions or Mark? Okay, so from a functional standpoint, as we all know, um, an AST creates a volume load. So if I go back to that first slide I showed you, and we're looking at the whole scheme of things, we're now talking about a volume load uh, on the right ventricle, uh, which is going to uh, affect the function. And so we're looking at uh, the effect of loading on right ventricular function. So when we look at loading, it's very important to differentiate between an acute change in loading and a chronic change in loading. So when you're interpreting an image and you say there's a lot of preload here, it's very important that ASD has been there their whole life, it's going to be a chronic change in loading. Or if you have a rupture of a papering muscle and you suddenly get MR, that's a completely different situation. Because adaptation is going to be completely different in an acute loading and chronic loading. So actually when you think of ASD and closure of ASD and an acute decrease in preload, it's actually quite interesting to see uh, what happens uh, with the heart. Now I'll get back to this, to this concept over and over today, so don't worry if it doesn't all come in at once. But generally, if the way the heart deals with an increased loading is to increase its diameter and to increase its stroke volume, right? It's getting more volume in stroke volume is going to increase. The way it adapts to that is by increasing its dimension and increasing the stroke volume. Now if you look at strain and strain rate, and each of these is a each of these colors is a constant stroke volume. 
What the heart wants to do is to keep blood ejected to the body. That's the stroke volume. It doesn't care about anything else. So if you keep your stroke volume constant, for any given diameter, your strain and strain rate will decrease. Think about it intuitively. If you've got a larger heart and you need to give out the same amount of blood, you need to contract less to do that, given if your contractility um, is the same. So, for, again, I'm just going to repeat that. For any increasing uh, stroke volume, for an increasing diameter, your strain is going to go down. These things are important because when you judge the heart visually, when you just look at its function, you, what you're really doing is you're looking at the size and the stroke volume of the heart and you're saying, well, this is good function. So that's what we do visually. But you're not really judging the function. You're also judging that adaptation. Now, one of the things when we look at these, uh, just to demonstrate this concept of a change in deformation and where strain has been useful is in the fetus. When people look at tissue velocities, which I told you are, is motion, it's the speed of the tissue, over the fetus and over gestational age, generally there's an increase in uh, velocities. That was an Italian study. Here is another study showing that there's an increase in velocities over gestation. So people said, oh, well, the fetal myocardium is maturing over gestation. But if you look at strain, the deformation, it actually doesn't change much during uh, gestation. In this p paper um, from Israel, there was actually a decrease in uh, deformation. Other people have shown that actually strain doesn't change over deformation. So that was demonstrating the principle I talked to you before. As the fetal heart got bigger, the motion, the velocities uh, increased because there's just more heart, but the strain, the actual deformation, uh, didn't change. So how does this translate into volume loading and ASD? Well, I've told you that uh, an ASD creates volume loading. You can see an enlarged right ventricle versus uh, the left ventricle. And I just want to, uh, for a moment, stop on this anecdote, because this is work by Giovanni de Salva, and I'm showing it for three reasons. A, I like Giovanni. Second, he's Italian, and he's from Napoli, and three, he's doing great work. So he actually, when, when strain first came out, he used ASD and ASD devices just to demonstrate uh, these things. So if you look at velocities versus strain, and you take a velocity on the ASD device itself, those same devices that Geary showed, Norman showed, etc., you can see that compared to the left atrial wall, you, you have almost the same velocity because the device is moving in the heart. But if you take strain of the device, it's 7% versus 85% of the wall. And actually that 7% may be correct because that device does change a bit in its velocity. So that was just a nice anecdote to show the difference between the two. So what happens then if you take a volume load, you put in a device, you suddenly decrease that volume load on the right ventricle. Well, Linda Pollux looked at this, and you can actually see, here's before, these are velocities. Here's before, here's after, and here's one day after. You can see actually that there's an, wherever you're looking in the right ventricle, there's an acute decrease in velocities, and then a normalization. This is part of that chronic adaptation, but generally the, the velocities are going to stay uh, the same. And here's just in uh, image format the same, the same things. Here's the RV, here's the velocity before it comes down a bit, whether you're looking at systole or diastole, and then shortly after, it's 24 to 48 hours, it just returns to the same thing. Taken away the load, velocities came down a bit, and then the heart normalizes. If you look at strain, however, and this is work from the Leuven group, I'm going to quote them a lot over the three days, this is Benedict uh, Aiskins, you can see that actually strain doesn't change. Because of the chronic adaptation, your strain in the clinical uh, scenario doesn't change much uh, in ASD. So here are the strain curves. Uh, here's end systolic longitudinal strain. Here's strain rate. And if you look at the aggregate data, here you can see, again, with closure of ASDs before in 24 hours, and here's the control, that the strain has gone down. You'll note that there was a mistake in their uh, uh, index over here. But nonetheless, the velocities go down, as I showed you. Strain overall doesn't change much. So from uh, images like this, or from studies like this, people thought that strain is less load dependent than velocities. That's probably true, but there's no way it can be independent of loading. It has to be dependent on loading because the change in 
in contraction and in dimensions of the heart is dependent on loading. We know that from the Frank Starling effect and from many uh, other things. But relatively in the clinical scenario, it's probably less dependent uh, on loading. So is surgery or catheter better to close an ASD? Well, a uh, lot of numbers here, but all I really want to show you is that group one uh, was the surgical closure, group two uh, was the catheter closure, and group three is the controls. If you just uh, look at, um, at, at strain or at uh, velocity, uh, velocities in this uh, uh, study, you can see that before um, the uh, velocities uh, were similar, but after surgery, uh, the velocities uh, are lower uh, than after catheter, which are similar to controls. If you look at the myocardial performance index as a global index, you can see that the group that had surgical closure has a higher myocardial performance index uh, versus the group with catheter closure, and that may be related to the effects of bypass uh, on surgery. Now, I told you about the force frequency relationship beforehand. Michael Chung, uh, when he was in Toronto, looked at the force frequency relationship in the ICU after different procedures for congenital heart disease. And what's really interesting in ASD is that when for surgery, the force frequency relationship isn't really different uh, uh, from pre-op, whereas in other lesions like VSD, Tetralogy, Fontan, and others, you generally get a decrease in myocardial performance after surgery. That's intuitive. We know there are effects of cardiopulmonary bypass, but in ASD, that wasn't really shown uh, by this effect. I'm going to skip over this um, in, in interest of time. It uh, was a study that showed uh, opposite uh, effects. Now, I told you that uh, deformation is dependent on the, on the volumes. And this is from the left ventricle, but it will work the same for the right ventricle. As your end diastolic dimension or volume goes up, your strain generally will go down. And I'm going to come back to this concept, but perhaps we should be correcting strain for the volume in order to correct for this preload. So Andrew Dragulescu in our institution uh, is doing this, looking uh, at different pathologies. And the ASD patients are in the green triangles. And this is strain corrected for the preload. Here she's correcting it for RV length. You could correct it for end diastolic volumes or whatever. And here's looking at the RV output by MRI. And you can see that in general, when you correct your strain for the volume, patients with ASD have good function. You can see the controls are the red, the ASD is the triangles. So the ASD patients work on a larger dimension with more output, but they have the same level uh, of uh, deformation. And this is just another way of looking at the same thing. Again, I'm going to skip over it for interest of time, uh, showing the same result. So if we just summarize then, the deformation alone does not give adequate information because you've got to take into account the loading conditions or the size uh, of the heart. It's influenced by the geometry, by the afterload and preload, and also by heart rate. And in ASD, we see that myocardial deformation is generally normal, even when you correct it for the preload. And actually, surprisingly, I think, doesn't change that much after you close it with, uh, after you close the ASD and decrease the RV uh, preload. So we have to integrate this geometrical and loading uh, information to provide more insight into the mechanics. Before I start, I just want to make every, sure everybody could hear me without the microphone. That was fine. Yeah? So atrial septal defects. Um, for the most part, echocardiography is usually very good at uh, looking at the atrial septal defects. The problem begins, as Dr. Grish was saying, in patients that are morbidly obese, where the image view from the transthoracic isn't as good, 
or in patients where an atrial septal defect was not diagnosed early on in childhood, and now they're adults, and you're trying to look at the information that you're going to get. One of the things that echocardiogram um, is not as good at doing is figuring out the QPQS. You know, if a patient doesn't have a large QPQS, the need to really close the atrial septal defect decreases, and the need for intervention decreases. Um, we're also going to look at that to evaluate the right ventricular and diastolic volume and systolic volume and the ejection fracture. <coughs> so back to velocity encoded imaging. This is the Doppler that I was showing you. Um, you can see up here. So you can see up here the um, pulmonary artery and down here the aorta, and you're going to get your systolic volume flow through that, and then you're going to take a look to see what that is and get a QPQS. This first patient um, that uh, I'm showing a secundum atrial septal defect in, this was a morbidly obese um, teenager who was complaining of shortness of breath with exercise and initially was diagnosed with asthma and then uh, came to the lab to be seen by MRI and you can see that they have a very clear secundum atrial septal defect. You can see also in CINE images, like I was telling you before, very similar to the um, echo images modality. Here is the septum between the left, left atrium and the right atrium. You can see the IVC coming in. You can see the aorta in the center, the main pulmonary artery up here, and you can see the abnormality, secundum atrial septal defect, and same thing over here in this image. Now in this patient, some of you may be able to diagnose without me playing the image, but if I play the image, you can see here is the right, the left atrium, the right atrium, and the SVC that should be coming in, you can see a pulmonary vein actually coming in right through here, and you get a sinus venosus atrial septal defect. Uh, Dr. Sanders showed that very nicely in pathology, and here you can see it um, in live image. That same patient had a very big right ventricle. You can see the left ventricle is squeezing quite well. There's um, good ejection fraction. You can see probably a pretty good ejection fraction on the right ventricle, but you can see how big it is and how dilated it is from that. I'm going to introduce one more image modality that I didn't show you guys the first time. This is what's called non-contrast MRA. No contrast is being given to the patient, but we're actually going to look at all of the heart in an EKG gated. And the way this works is there's two images that are being acquired at the same time. One of the images looking at the diaphragm and where it is. It's a very low grade image. And all it's trying to figure out is, is the diaphragm in the same location or is it in a different location? When the diaphragm is in the same location, then the image acquisition is actually taken of the heart. And what that allows you is a patient can be free breathing and you're going to get a whole heart imaging. And I'll show you guys 3D renditions of this at some of the later more complex anatomy so you can get it. So here's the image I was telling you, the low acquisition image. It's almost like a respiratory bellow and it's done over the diaphragm right over here. And you're going to do it on the right side so it doesn't interfere with your image. And you're going to watch the diaphragm go up and down when it's in the right location and you're going to get the diastolic standstill of the heart, you're going to acquire the images. So it's going to look something like this. And then the images is going to show you the whole heart. And the reason this is important is because there are um, uh, different structures in the heart where if you were to inject from the right arm, for example, you're going to miss, like the left superior vena cava. So here is the non-contrast MRA. You can see the left superior vena cava. Here's the contrast MRA, where contrast was being given from a right arm, and you're missing the left superior vena cava. You barely see it. Same thing here, you can see the coronary, left superior vena cava coming into the coronary sinus, and you would miss it completely in the contrast enhanced MRA. Now the reason the contrast enhanced MRA is nice is because you're going to see structures inside extra, extra, intracardiac structures besides extracardiac structures, and you're going to see much more definition. Here's the contrast enhanced, uh, non-contrast enhanced MRA. You can see the uh, papillary muscles. And here in the contrast enhanced, that's non-EKG gated, you're not going to see it as nice. The aorta, which for the most part doesn't move much 
once it's past the heart, but in the aortic root does, you can see much better imaging in the non-contrast MRE. And why is that important for our ASD? Because here you can see a pulmonary vein, and you can see it entering into the right atrium. You can see it up here as well. These show you where you are located in all three locations, and here it is with the SBC. Now I can move this in an image modality, I can move it back and forth and show you the 3D reconstruction, but just for ease, I just took several pictures. Here you can see the pulmonary veins coming very clearly into the SBC and then into the right atrium. Same here and same there. And just one more image to show that. Again, you can see that very clearly. You can see here another sinus venosus. This one is actually the right lower pulmonary veins coming into the IVC. You can see the right ventricle is dilated. You don't really see the IVC very much in this image. But then you can switch it and go into a four-chamber stack, and then you're beginning to see that that's entering abnormally. And right here, you can see it entering into the left atrium. Even better, here's the pulmonary vein that's coming in, joining into the IVC, and an abnormal connection right through here into the right atrium. And then you could do that twist MRA that I told you guys earlier. And you can see the pulmonary vein that's coming in inappropriately. And you can see that there's contrast enhancement continuing into the right ventricle when it should all be in the left ventricle as pulmonary vein contrast returns into the IVC. So just quick conclusion, you can see a QPQS, anatomy, evaluation of the end diastolic volume and end systolic volumes, and uh, that helps a lot with ASDs. So I think we're going to open this for questions and answers. If anybody has any questions from the audiences or um, any interesting... Um, this question might sound a little bit silly. I'm a general pediatrician with the interesting cardiology. I sometimes get confused to differentiate echocardiographic and if you're doing small atrial septal second down and patent from an open. How I can be sure echocardiographic Dr. Silverman, would you like to answer that question? No, I think you could do that, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> We've discussed this before. Yes. You knew this question was coming. Yes. I mean, I think, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, I think one of the issues, uh, frequent issue, is the patent for Raymond O'Valley in general. I mean, I think that you, earlier Dr. Silverman asked how many immunotologists are in here, and there are quite a few. Uh, do you follow the patent for Raymond O'Valley when you find it? Do you not follow those patients? Do you see them again? When do you decide to see them again? Do you see them again at three years of age? And if it's still present, what do you do with it? I think. Each person sort of decides for themselves, or as an institution sort of decides from the, for themselves was what to do. Um, we know from pathology specimens that about 30% of adults have a probe patent for Raymond or Valley. In other words, it's still open, the flap may be closed but not sealed, and if they do a Valsalva maneuver or something of that sort, a little blood can be going from the right side to the left side. I think that becomes an issue as patients don't take good care of themselves. They become obese, DVTs begin to form, and then you could potentially have a stroke or a TIA or things of that nature. I mean, I don't think there is a clear delineation. I think every practice does that slightly different. I think one of the things that I try and explain to parents, for the most part, about paying for Raymond O'Valley's is that many people live very long into life and obviously remaining healthy is the most important thing. And then I try to tell them, quote a few of the studies, if, if the PFO at, at six months or younger, if the PFO or secundometrial septal defect, depending on what you want to call it, is less than um, three millimeters, we know that it has approximately a 99% chance of full closure. In other words, we're not going to see blood crossing it by the time the child is three years of age. If the measurement of the PFO is between three to eight millimeters, that percentage goes down to 85%, and eight millimeters or greater, that percentage goes down to 30%. 
Now, I think that's important because that also tells you which patients you should follow. If you see a small PFO under three millimeters, I don't usually see them back again in follow-up. I'm almost certain that it's going to close, or if it doesn't close, it's going to be so minimal that it's probably not going to affect the child where there's going to be right ventricular volume overload. And if there's no right ventricular volume overload, I think at this stage, it's not worthwhile sending them to the cath lab to have that closed to prevent strokes later on in life. If it's larger, then I, you know, depending on the size, decide accordingly if I should see the patients back. Does that help answer the question a little bit? No? Steve, do you want to say something about that? You seem to be nodding away. Yes. <laughs> well, you may just say, he may completely tell you a different answer. No, 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 I think you're exactly right. I, I mean, I don't think, certainly early on, that you can distinguish between a small atrial septally that's something that's going to persist and a fatal brain valve with echocardiography. Uh, I mean, the, the, the idea is a, a fatal foramen, there's overlap of septal priming with septal secundi, so that a valve mechanism, a door against the door jam function can occur. The idea of a Secundum atrial septal defect is where septum priming doesn't reach septum secundum, so there can never be closure of the door, okay? Now, what about something that's right at the edge? Well, obviously, it's, that's the point, is it's very, it's impossible to make that kind of distinction very early in life, and that's why the study that Dr. Esbani was telling you about indicates that there's a very high likelihood the smaller the opening, the better the likelihood is that this really is a frame that's gonna close and won't be uh, available for shunting later in life. The larger it is, the less likely, the, the more separation there is between septum primum and septum secundum, and the more likely it's going to stay open and actually be an atrial septal defect later. The only way to know is to see what happens. I mean, I, I don't think there's any absolute predictive uh, uh, data uh, about these things. Sorry, I, I, I absolutely agree with you, but I'd like to evict the question here. Um, I think that the uh, atrial septum, when you look at it in the neonate style septum treatment, as you showed on your pictures, is almost like an onion skin. Yeah. It's that thin. And certainly it changes its thickness, sure. its resilience, its uh, it it muscular. Right. Sure. So um, what, what we've done with a number of our patients is, and I think you just said the same thing, is we'll bring them back at two or three years of age. It's just it's right. And of course, obviously, uh, pediatricians have got ears. They can listen if they hear a white split or if there's a, a, a small uh, right ventricular heave or maybe a, an RSL prime on the ECG. Maybe that's another indication to trigger in the echocardiogram. Yeah. And the other thing, thing is, of course, for neonatologists, all babies, all yeah. neonates, have a happy frame of value. If they don't, they're very sick. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> they usually go quite the valve to this. Sorry, what about the direction of the shunt itself? Unless there is something else wrong with the baby, after a day or so of life, the shunt is going to be from left atrium to yeah, right atrium. Yeah, I mean, it's left to right, but I mean, uh, PFO is usually the shunt is directed a uh, little bit downward. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's again a soft, yeah. that's very soft. It I wouldn't rely direction. on that for any known yeah. importance. We've seen it directed up because yeah. if you look where that valve that's is right. suspended on the roof of the atrium, and the natural tendency for that blood is to go up. So whether it goes down or whether it goes up, yes, it's, uh, I would much of a much. Yeah. And I mean, I think the same thing is true like for fenestration. Like initially we thought if it's fenestrated, then it's most likely to remain a secundum. And I think that's also been shown that you can have a fenestrated PFO that then continues on to close as the atrial septum continues to grow. I think one of the things that you have to remember is the heart continues to grow after birth the atrial septum especially continues to grow. We know that on the other side, when there is a problem in hypoplastic left heart where there is atrial restriction, you can have the surgeon swears to you, they cut the whole atrial septum when they went in to do the Norwood, it's, it's totally gone, and then it comes right back because obviously whatever has caused it initially to close that caused the hypoplastic left heart is now causing it to, again to continue growing. So, I don't know about that part. But, but I'm saying like there's probably a genetic it continues to grow, in other words. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to um, say something um, and, and ask some questions about um, the TE um, and uh, the um, 
especially that with the lifestyle. And the biggest problem that we have, and that we all have, is we know that uh, the amount of data transfer in a, um, the PD is so high that it's reached the limits of electrical conduction. So you can't put any more data out into the machine to process it. So that, in fact, what 3D has done is it takes the data and starts processing it in the transducer. So it can send a least some semi-processed data. And what that does is that makes um, that makes um, the transducer bigger. And so I'll get to that in a moment. We're going to take a break. break? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So we, we all need a break. I think yeah. I'll cut this down the road. I'll meet you all there. But I think that the one issue is that what size can you start doing 3D in? I was just looking at the patients that we have for uh, device closure. Many, many of them are under 20 kilograms. What is the limit that you think you can put the adult probe um, into, a, into a chart? Yeah, so we've, we've uh, under general anesthesia, um, the smallest kit that we put it in was, uh, was an 18 kilo kit. We've had um, one patient who was 47 kilos in whom the probe did not go down. And even the adult 2DT probe did not go down on that patient. We didn't know why. We just ended up using the mini multi probe on that patient. And then last week we had a 30 kilo person in the OR where the, uh, where the 3DT did not go down. Just uh, one point um, for anybody that typically is doing this. Um, you, they obviously have anesthesia for this. You must have, be able to record pressure in the lower body. And if you take an arterial pulse, uh, and you see sometimes when the probe goes in, especially when you bend it, that it pushes back on the aorta and lower aortic blood pressure. So you have to watch out very carefully when you put the stroke in that you're not uh, including the aorta. So another reason not to be able to do the It's not that big. <laughs> it's two millimeters bigger than the Yeah, it is, or. but it's, it's so two millimeters <laughs> is what really counts for some of the patients. Eh? All right, so we're gonna, what we're going to do is the following. Um, we're going to move PDAs, I'm sorry dear Ms. Collinges, to the end of the day, okay? Uh, and when we come back after the break, we're going to carry on with ventricular septal defects, and we'll do ventricular septal defects and AV septal defects, and then we'll see what happens if there's a lot of time, which I somehow doubt, uh, before lunch, 